This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of courses covering dozens of creative and entrepreneurial skills. Want to support this show? Well, take a free trial with Skillshare for two whole months. In that two whole months, you could learn a bunch of things from a bunch of different courses all without costing you a penny, which is pretty nice. I've done a bunch of stuff on Skillshare last time I talked about a productivity course. I've also taken a course called Creating Pro Video with Tools You Already Own from a chap called Mark Saracimo. Uh, the reason I did that is people email me all the time about YouTube and I always tell them to just go and get started. That's the best thing to do. And it's really surprising what you can do with the tools that you already own, like a mobile phone for instance. Skillshare has thousands of courses, unlimited access with premium, two months for free. Please use the link below. The favorite instrument of the likes of Lisa Simpson, former president Bill Clinton, and the co-author of this script and founder of Today I Found Out, the saxophone has variously been described as everything from the most moving and heart-gripping wind instrument to the devil's horn. Rather fittingly, then, the instrument's inventor, Adolf Sax, was a similarly polarizing figure and led a life many would qualify as fulfilling all of the necessary specifications to be classified as being all kinds of badass. Born in 1814 in the Belgian municipality of Dinant, Sax was initially named Antoine Joseph Sax, but started going by the name Adolphe seemingly almost from birth, though why he didn't go by his original name and how Adolphe came to be chosen has been lost to history. Born the son of a carpenter and later instrument maker Charles Sax, Adolphe Sax was surrounded by music from an early age, becoming especially proficient at playing both the flute and the clarinet. Sax's affinity for wind instruments quickly became apparent in his early teens when he began improving upon and refining the designs of these instruments as well as coming up with many more. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here because Sax was immeasurably lucky to even make it into adulthood given what he went through as a child. Described as chronically accident prone, throughout his childhood, Sax fell victim to a series of increasingly unusual mishaps, several of which nearly cost him his life. Sax's first major incident occurred at age three when he fell down three flights of stairs and landed unceremoniously at the bottom with his head smacking on the stone floor there. Reports of the aftermath vary somewhat, from being in a coma for a week to simply being bedridden for that period, unable to stand properly. Young Sax would later accidentally swallow a large needle, which he miraculously passed without incident or injury. On that note, apparently keen on swallowing things that could cause him harm, as a child he drank a concoction of white lead, copper oxide, and arsenic. In another incident, Sax accidentally fell onto a burning stove, reportedly receiving severe burns to his side. Luckily, he seemingly avoided the severe infection that can sometimes follow this, although part of his body was forever scarred. Perhaps the closest he came to dying occurred when he was 10 when he fell into a river. This fact was not discovered until a random villager observed Sax floating face down near a mill. He was promptly plucked from the river and later regained consciousness. But we're still not done here because in another incident, he got blown across his father's workshop when a container of gunpowder exploded when he was standing right next to it. Yet again, courting death, the young Sax was injured while working in the streets when a large slate tile flew off a nearby roof and hit him right on the head, rendering him temporarily comatose. All of these injuries led Sax's understandably worried mother Maria to openly say that her young son was condemned to misfortune before adding, he won't live. Sax's numerous brushes with death also led to his neighbors jokingly referring to him as the ghost child from Dinant. Besides apparently giving his all to practicing for a future audition in a Final Destination film, on the side, as noted, Sax made musical instruments. In fact, he became so adept at this that when the young man grew into adulthood and began submitting his instruments to the Belgium National Exhibition, for a few years running, he was recommended by the judges for the gold medal for the competition. It was only the central jury who made the final decision and denied it to him because of his age. They explained to him that if he won the gold, he would then have achieved the pinnacle of success at the competition and thus would have nothing to strive for in the following year. In the final of these competitions, he entered at the age of 27 in 1841. This was actually to be the public debut of the saxophone, but according to a friend of Sax, George Kastner, when Sax wasn't around, someone, rumored to be a competitor who disliked the young upstart, kicked the instrument, sending it flying and damaging it too severely to be entered into the competition. 
Nonetheless, Sachs was recommended for the premier gold medal at the exhibition, thanks to his other submitted instruments, but the central jury once again denied this to him. This was the final straw with Sachs retorting, If I am too young for the gold medal, I am too old for the silver. Now a grown man, and having seemingly outgrown what it was possible to achieve in Dinant, Sachs decided a move was in order, choosing Paris as his destination in order to set up a shop. As to why, to begin with, in 1839, he had traveled to Paris to demonstrate his designs for a bass clarinet to one Isaac de Costa, who was a clarinet player at the Paris Academy of Music. De Costa himself also had created his own improved version of the bass clarinet, but after hearing and playing Sachs's version, he was quickly impressed with it and by sax himself he then subsequently introduced sax around town to various prominent musicians giving sax many notable connections in paris to start from Further, not long after he was snubbed at the exhibition, Sachs had learned that certain members of the French government were keen on revitalizing the French military brands and were seeking new and improved instruments to do so. After mulling it over for some time, he decided to try his hand in the big city. Upon arriving in Paris in 1842, supposedly with a mere 30 francs in his pocket, Sachs invited noted composer Hector Berlioz to come and review his instruments, resulting in an incredibly glowing review published on June the 12, 1842, in the Journal de Debat. Unfortunately for him, this was the start of an issue that would plague Sachs the rest of his life, pitting himself up against the combined might of the rest of the musical instrument makers in Paris, who quite literally would go on to form an organization just to take him down. But once again, we're getting ahead of ourselves here. As for Berlioz's review of Sachs's work, he wrote, Monsieur Adolphe Sachs of Brussels is a man of penetrating mind, lucid, tenacious, with a perseverance against all trials and great skill. He is at the same time a calculator, acoustician, and as necessary also a smelter, turner, and engraver. He can think and act. He invents and accomplishes. Composers will be much indebted to Monsieur Sachs when his instruments come into general use. May he persevere. He will not lack support from friends of art. Partially as a result of this piece, Sachs was invited to perform a concert at the Paris Conservatoire to much fanfare and success. This, in turn, along with his former connections from his 1839 visit, ended up seeing Sachs making many friends quickly among certain prominent musicians and composers who were impressed with his work. All this, in turn, saw Sachs have little trouble acquiring the needed funds to set up the Adolphe Sachs Musical Instrument Factory. Needless to say, this young Belgian upstart, who was seemingly a prodigy when it came to inventing and improving on existing instruments, threatened to leave the other musical instrument makers in Paris in the dust. Said rivals thus began resorting to every underhanded trick in the book to try and ruin him, from frequent slanderous newspaper articles to lawsuits to attempting to have his work boycotted. For example, in 1843, one Dom Sebastian was composing his opera Gaetano Donizetti and had decided to use Sax's design for a bass clarinet, which, as noted, was significantly improved over other instrument makers of the day's versions. Leveraging their connections with various musicians in the opera, many of whom worked closely with various other musical instrument makers around town, the threat was made that if Sebastian chose to have Sax's bass clarinet used in the opera, the orchestra members would refuse to play. This resulted in Sebastian abandoning plans to use Sax's instrument. In the past, and indeed in many such instances where his instruments would be snubbed or insulted by others, Sachs had been known to challenge fellow musicians besmirching his name to musical duels pitting their talents against one another in a very public way. Owing to his prodigious skill at not just making extremely high-quality instruments, but also playing them, Sachs frequently won such duels. In this case, it is not clear if he extended such a challenge, however. Whatever the case, as one witness to the harassment, the aforementioned composer Hector Berlioz would write in a letter dated October 8, 1843, it is scarcely to be believed that this gifted young artist should be finding it difficult to maintain his position and make a career in Paris. The persecutions he suffers are worthy of the Middle Ages and recall the antics of the enemies of Benvenuto, the Florentine sculptor. They lure away his workmen, steal his designs, accuse him of insanity, and bring legal proceedings against him. Such is the hatred inventors inspire in rivals who are incapable of inventing anything themselves. 
His audacious plans didn't help matters. As noted, when he got to Paris, one of the things he hoped to accomplish was land a rather lucrative contract with the French military to see his instruments alone used by them. A centerpiece of this, he hoped, was his new and extremely innovative saxophone. While it seems commonplace today in a lot of ways, the saxophone was a revolution at the time, effectively combining major elements of the woodwind families with the brass. As Berlioz would note of this saxophone in his review of it, it cries, sighs, and dream. It possesses a crescendo and can gradually diminish its sound until it is only an echo of an echo of an echo. Until its sound becomes crepuscular. The timbre of the saxophone has something vexing and sad about it in the high register. The low notes, to the contrary, are of a grandiose nature, one could say pontifical. For works of a mysterious and solemn character, the saxophone is, in my mind, the most beautifully low voice known to this today. Exactly when Sachs first publicly debuted the saxophone to the world isn't clear, with dates as early as 1842 sometimes being thrown around. However, we do know that during one of his earliest performances with the instrument at the Paris Industrial Exhibition in 1844, Sachs played a rousing solo from behind a large curtain. Why? Well, Sachs was paranoid about his instrument's design being copied, and as he hadn't yet patented it, he decided that the best way to avoid this was to simply not let the general public see what it looked like. This brings us to the military. As previously noted, French military music was languishing in disgrace. Thus, keen to revitalize it in the name of patriotism, the French government created a commission to explore ways to reform the military bands in innovative ways. Two months after announcing this to the world and inviting manufacturers to submit their instruments for potential use by the military, a concert of sorts was put on in front of a crowd of 20,000 in Paris on April 22, 1845. Two bands would perform in the concert, with one using more traditional instruments, and the other armed with various types of saxophones and other modifications on existing instruments by sax. Both bands played the same works by composer Adolf Adam. The band using sax's instruments won by a landslide. Two months later, on August 9, 1845, they awarded sax the lucrative military contract it set out to get when he first moved to Paris. This was the last straw. When Sachs, a Belgium no less, secured the contract to supply the French military, his rivals decided to literally form an organization who might as well have called themselves the anti sax Club. But in the end, they went with, and apologies for my French here, l'Association Générale de Ouviers en Instruments de Musique which means in English, something I can pronounce, the United Association of Instrument Makers. This was an organization to which the most prominent and talented instrument maker in France at the time was most definitely not welcome to join. Their principal order of business throughout Sachs's lifetime seemed to be to try and ruin Sachs in any way they could. To begin with, they adopted the age-old practice of, if you can't beat em, sue em. This was a long-running tactic of the organization simply designed to tie up Sachs's resources, time, and energy in any possible way by keeping him in court. The first legal action of this group was to challenge Sachs's patent application on the saxophone, initially claiming, somewhat bizarrely, that the instrument as described in the patent didn't technically exist. When that failed, they claimed the instrument was unmusical, and that, in any event, Sax had simply modified designs from other makers. They then presented various other instruments that had preceded it as examples, none of which the court agreed were similar enough to the saxophone to warrant not granting the patent. Next up, they claimed the exact design had long existed before, made by other manufacturers in other countries, and that Sachs was falsely claiming it as his own. To prove this, the group produced several literally identical instruments to Sachs's saxophone, bearing foreign manufacturing markings, and supposedly had been made years before. The truth was that they had simply purchased saxophones from Sachs's company and then sent them to foreign workshops where Sachs's labeling had been removed and it had been replaced with the shop owner's own labels. Unfortunately for the United Association of Instrument Makers, this ruse was discovered and they had to come up with a new strategy. They then claimed that since Sachs had very publicly played the instrument on several occasions, it was no longer eligible for a patent. At this point, fed up with the whole thing, an infuriated sax countered by withdrawing his patent application and giving other instrument makers permission to make a saxophone if they had the skill. He gave his rivals a year to do this, in which time nobody was able to successfully replicate the instrument with any quality. Shortly before the year was up, with no challenger apparently capable, he then resubmitted his patent application, and this time it was quickly granted on June 2, 1846. 
Apparently not content with just trying to metaphorically ruin his life and business, at one point Sachs's workshop mysteriously caught fire, and in another, an unknown assassin fired a pistol at one of Sachs's assistants, thinking that it was Sachs, with it being rumored that the United Association of Instrument Makers was behind both of these goings on. Whether true or not, things took a turn for the worse for Sachs after King Louis Philippe fled the country in 1848. In the aftermath of the revolution, and with many of Sachs's high placed friends now ousted, the United Association of Instrument Makers were able to simultaneously petition to have Sachs's contract with the military revoked, and by 1849 were able to have his patents for the Bugles as Cylindres and Saxa Tromba likewise revoked, freeing up his rivals to make these instruments themselves. They also attempted to have his patent for the saxophone squashed, but they were unsuccessful on that one. Sachs, not one to take this lying down, appealed, and after a five-year legal battle, the imperial court at Rouen finally concluded the matter, siding with Sachs and reinstating his patents, as well as ordering the association to pay damages for the significant loss of revenue in the years that the legal battle had raged. Nevertheless, before this happened, in 1852, Sachs found himself financially ruined, though interestingly his final downfall came thanks to a friend. During this time, as noted, Sachs was fighting various legal battles, had lost his military contract, and was otherwise struggling to keep his factory afloat. That's when a friend gave him 30,000 francs to help keep things going. Sachs had originally understood this to be a gift not a loan. Whether it was or wasn't isn't clear, but when said individual died a couple of years later in 1852, his heirs certainly noticed the previous transaction and inquired about it with Sags, demanding that he repay the 30,000 francs and giving him a mere 24 hours to come up with the money. Unable to do so, Sachs fled to London while simultaneously once again finding himself embroiled in yet another legal drama. In this case, the courts eventually demanded Sachs repay the 30,000 francs, causing him to have to file for bankruptcy and close down his factory. But this is Adolf Sachs we're talking about, a man who had survived major blows to the head, drowning, explosion, poisoning, severe burns, beatings by thugs presumably hired by the United Association of Instrument Makers, an assassination attempt, and literally the combined might of just about every prominent instrument maker in his field in Paris. Fittingly for a man who is quoted as saying, in life there are conquerors and the conquered. I most prefer to be among the first. So Sachs, he wasn't about to just quit. And so it was that continuing to work at his craft in 1854, Sachs found himself back on top, appointed musical instrument maker to the household troops of Emperor Napoleon III. His new benefactor also helped Sachs emerge from bankruptcy and reopen his factory. It's at this point, however, that we should point out that, as indicated by his childhood, it clearly wasn't just other instrument makers that were against Sachs, but well, the universe as well. A year before his appointment by Napoleon III, Sachs noticed a black growth on his lip that continued to grow over time. By 1859, this tumor had grown to such a size that he could not eat or drink properly and was forced to consume sustenance through a tube. Just to kick him when he was down, shortly before this, in 1858, Sachs's firstborn child, Charles, died at the age of just two. Going back to the cancer, his choice at this point in 1859 was to be subjected to a risky and disfiguring surgery, including removing part of his jaw and much of his lip, or submit himself to experimental medicine of the age. He chose the latter, ultimately being treated by an Indian doctor by the name of Rees, who administered some private concoction made of a variety of herbs. Whether the treatment did it, or Sachs's own body simply decided that it would not let something as trivial as cancer stop it from continuing to soldier on, within six months from the start of the treatment, and after having had the tumor for some six years at this point, Sachs's giant tumor it began to get smaller. By February of 1860, it had disappeared completely. The rest of Sachs's life went pretty much as what had come before, variously impressing the world with his talents in musical instrument making, as well as fighting constant legal battles with the United Association of Instrument Makers attempting to thwart him in any way they could, while simultaneously the musical instrument makers behind it profiting from Sachs's designs as his patents expired. Finally fed up with everything, a then 72-year-old near-destitute Sachs attempted to get justice outside of the courts with an aptly titled article called Appeal to the Public, published in La Musique de Famille in 1887. The article outlined the many ways in which Sachs had been wronged by the United Association of Instrument Makers and the near constant, often frivolous legal battles he fought throughout his time in Paris with them. He then summed up, 
Before me, I am proud to say the musical instrument industry was nothing or next to nothing in France. I created this industry. I carried it to an unrivaled height. I developed the legions of workers and musicians. And it is, above all, my counterfeiters who have profited from my work. While none of this worked at getting the general public to rally to his defense, it did result in many prominent musicians and composers around Paris petitioning that Sachs, who had indeed contributed much to the French musical world, should be given a pension so that he could at least be comfortable in the latter years of his life. The result of this was a modest pension ultimately granted towards this end. On the side, when he wasn't fighting countless legal battles and inventing and making instruments, Sachs also had a penchant for dreaming up alternate inventions, such as designing a device that could launch a 500-ton, 11-yard-wide mortar bullet, and he called it, we're not making this up, the Saxa Cannon. He also designed a truly massive organ intended to be built on a hillside near Paris, capable of being heard clearly by anyone throughout the city whenever it was played. In the end, Sachs died at the age of 79 in 1894 and was buried in the Montmartre Cemetery in Paris. So, Sachs had musical skills, and you can too, with Skillshare. Now, I checked out what musical courses they have, and they absolutely do have classes on playing the saxophone. Now, I have no idea how to play the saxophone, and no particular desire to learn how to play the saxophone, but if you want to, you can do it on Skillshare. As for me, as I mentioned at the top of this video, I've done many courses on Skillshare that are a bit more up my street. Video production, I did that course on creating pro video with tools you already own. It's a great one. I've also done courses on productivity and plenty of other, you know, creative business related stuff. Premium membership with Skillshare gives you unlimited access to thousands of their classes, and there's no kind of individual fee per class. So whether you want to fuel your curiosity, your creativity, or your career, do it on Skillshare. And with two months for free, and then a super affordable $10 a month if you want to continue, it's a far more cost-effective way to learn than with in-person courses. So look, these super long videos, they take a lot to make and supporting Skillshare supports us. So please just go through the link in the description below to check out Skillshare. It really does us a favor. And thanks for watching.